Welcome to the Growing Pollinator Program presented by Jackson County Library Services. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. So now I'll give it over to Christina Lefervre. She is the president of the Pollinator Project Rogue Valley and will address the essentials of pollinator habitats. Thank you, Christina, for spending time with us today. Well, thank you, Carrie. Um, this is our third date for this uh, presentation. It's been quite the year, as we know, so I'm glad that we're finally doing this. Um, and I did put up the little question here. I always like to know where people are from, so if you'd like to put in the chat um, what city you claim, um, that would be lovely. And also, if you already have a pollinator garden. Um, and I'm noticing some of the people that have come in and I'm, I appreciate some of my friends being here. And I'd also like to recognize Phyllis Stiles. I see that Phyllis is here and I'm gonna talk about Phyllis again in just a moment. So stay tuned. Um, and if you want to um, change the view so that you're um, not seeing all the different people, you can do that up at the top of your um, I'm not sure what that's called, your controls, your Zoom controls. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go with the program um, called Pollinators in the Garden. Who, they are, who are they and how can we help? I'm wondering how many of you know what this beautiful creature is. I took this in yeah. my garden. <laughs> I, um, yeah, you might want to mute your... Um, speakers everyone so we, we can keep going. Um, this is a beautiful um, white line sphinx moth um, sipping on a monarda here from my garden a year or two ago. I felt very fortunate that I was able to see that. And this is another picture from my garden of I think last year. And <clears throat> I went ahead and attached this quote from the Xerxes Society to it because I think this is what moves me and I hope it shows you the picture, the global picture, if you will, um, where we're coming from, that we're wanting to stem the losses of insect diversity and we want to enhance the services they provide. So to do that, we have to take steps at all levels to protect, restore and enhance habitat for them and other creatures across our landscape, no matter what it is. So this is just something I think it's something important for all of us to keep in mind. Um, I am president of Pollinator Project Oak Valley. Um, we are a small nonprofit um, based in um, Phoenix. And this is our vision. We're volunteer led. We envision that people, communities, and landscapes are all working together to support and increase healthy and thriving pollinator species everywhere. Our office is in the um, Beyond Toxics office. We share an office with them there on Main Street and you'll see a picture of that office later. Um, I also wear a hat, B City USA Ashland. And this is a slide that I know Phyllis Stiles will be interested in seeing. Phyllis is the reason we have a B City program, B City USA program in the United States. Um, and she started the program in 2012 um, to get the city governments involved in looking at this pollinator situation and doing what they can to help. Because if you think of all the land that cities and parks hold, they can really do a lot to bring in native plants, reduce lawns, et cetera, et cetera. So here in Oregon, Southern Oregon, we are honored um, to, to have um, talent to be the uh, second B City USA in the country behind Asheville, which is where Phyllis started this. Um, and then Ashland is the fifth, Phoenix, Gold Hill, and Medford. And then Southern Oregon University is the first um, B Campus USA in the country. So we have a lot of pollinator people here. Um, and so it's quite interesting to see. And if you are not if you live in a city that's not listed on this list, then maybe we should talk, right, Phyllis? Um, let's see. 
I also was going to say one or two other things about myself that I forgot to say earlier. <clears throat> I moved to the Valley um, in 2012 from Georgia and um, became involved in a lot of things, um, working with pollinators, um, and I'm also on the board of Beyond Toxics. So I think those are some of the other things that I was going to bring up. So this is my agenda. Um, what we're gonna talk about today, what is pollination? Why do we care? Who are the pollinators? What are their challenges and how can we help? And then I added this at the bottom to be aware, be amazed, be observant and be thinking because it's not just the one little creature or the one little plant, but it's the entire ecosystem and, and having the mindset of what we can do to support the entire way of beings for these creatures. And then of course it benefits us as well. So I'm gonna start off with a hot topic as I like to say, plant sex. Um, because as we know, for any reproduction to occur, we do need to have two um, creatures get together and since um, plants aren't able to get up and ask the other plant for the first dance. Um, we need something that will help move them together. And so that is the um, pollination part of the, um, I hope I didn't just skip something. I just took my earbuds off. So let me start all over there. Um, this is where we're getting into the reason for um, pollinators because of reproduction. We need to have two creatures getting together. And since the plants can't get up and ask the other one for the first dance, then we're gonna need um, creatures such as insects. There's others that are also animals that do the same thing. The goal is to have a fertilized egg or seed in this case for plants. And so what happens is a bee or a butterfly or any other type of pollinator, it will move from the male part of the plant, which is the anther, it'll move a pollen grain to the female part of the plant and it will come down and fertilize the seed. And therefore we have um, a fruit or a flower that is gonna provide the pollen and nectar for the um, insects. And I love this little picture here because it is showing you in real life how the um, pollen grains are on the anthers and it's gonna come up to the stigma and come down and pollinate um, the actual seed. Um, so that's what's the all about pollination. Um, <clears throat> this is, it could either be the same uh, self-pollinated or it could be um, on a different uh, flower, usually a different flower. Not trying to get scientific here. This looks kind of scary with all of the um, verbiage here, but what I wanted to show you is that this beautiful diagram shows you that the insect has a positive charge and the flowers have a negative charge. So there's actually more to this than just meets the eye of an insect flying to the flower. There's actually uh, electromagnetism happening, um, forces of nature more than just um, the two meeting up in physical time. So why do we need pollination? Well, it's that sex thing that I was talking about because the plants getting together is what's creating the seed or the fruit production for reproduction. Um, and it's vital to the life cycle of most flowering plants. I think it's a fascinating um, fact here that over 120 million years, these plants and pollinators have evolved together. So they fit each other well. The plant evolves for whatever reason, and then the pollinator has to evolve over a short period of time to be able to continue to pollinate, to continue to access that food source, either the pollen, the nectar, or the actual leaf itself that it's gonna consume, for instance, a butterfly larva. So those, uh, that evolution over time is um, just, is 
to me mind boggling to think that the, this has been going on that long. And even more mind boggling to me, I'm amazed at numbers, 90% um, of all plant species need pollination. And with, remember we talked about the reproduction and of those creatures that provide this pollination service, 200,000 different species in the world, according to Xerxes. A thousand, only a thousand species are birds and bats, i.e. vertebrates. And then the rest, 199,000 are invertebrates, meaning insects, bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, and hummingbirds. So those are the primary ones here in the United States. Um, in this part of the region, Bats are not as uh, really a pollinator. We have bats, but they don't do a lot of pollinating because they are insect eaters. So they don't need to visit flowers. So we don't put bats on our list here in Southern Oregon. And if we didn't have pollinators, then we wouldn't have a lot of anything else in our world. Um, those seeds and fruits are eaten by many creatures, um, not just humans. Um, they are providing us our beautiful wildflowers. Um, and the bird population is declining because of the lack of insects around the world. So we really need to have um, the insects just to feed birds of no other reason. Um, I think it's interesting today. This is a photo I had taken off of um, Grizzly Peak, hmm, I don't know, a summer or two ago. And I can look out the window now and I can see that um, we have snow on Grizzly Peak. So that's a nice contrast. What happens if we have no pollinators? Um, this is a pretty stark picture, I think, to show you that. Um, this is a picture taken um, in China. They were having some despicable practices regarding pesticides for a number of years um, and no pollinators meant that people had to get up into the trees and pollinate their cherry trees. So um, hopefully that's not going to be happening here in the United States. You might have seen this um, slide before. This is from Whole Foods from a couple of years ago, just showing you what a shelf, what a store could look like if there was no pollination going on. Um, in, you know, if the pollinators stop and then our food choices diminish. Uh, I wonder how many of you know about under pollination, if you've gotten zucchinis like this in your garden. Um, Maybe that's what it shows up when you don't have enough, when there's not enough sex going on, right? <laughs> not enough pollination going on. So I think we've gone through um, what is pollination and why do we care about it? Um, if you do have any questions or comments so far, please do put them in the chat box um, and we'll take care of that towards the end. I think we'll have time for questions with no problems. So now we're gonna talk about who are the pollinators. So now I have a quiz for you. If you're looking at these six photos, which ones are bees? And if you wanna put it in the chat box, you can, or you can just think to yourself um, what it's gonna be. Ah, what it's gonna be, that was good. I'll let you look for just a little bit longer. And so here are your answers. So I don't know how many of you got it right or not. Phyllis, I know did. So Phyllis, I hope you didn't answer. Um, the hoverfly, I'm sure that every single one of you have seen a hoverfly. They're very common and they do look like a bee. If you notice though, this is sort of chubby, I guess you would say. It's, um, doesn't have a thin waist like this honeybee does. You also notice how hairy this honeybee is and how fat, how big its legs are to carry the pollen. And the eye is shaped here compared to the big eye, very robust eyes of the hoverfly. Notice the short antenna. There is no pollen collecting hairs on the leg 
Um, you probably can't see it here, but there's also a difference in the number of wings. And you'll notice that every single bee are all hairy bodied because they're obviously gonna be carrying pollen and nectar back to their young. And then this Ignuman wasp, obviously again, no pollen collecting hairs on its legs or on its body really. Um, wasps are good pollinators, not as good as bees, but they are able, certainly able to do the services. They provide so many services um, in our environment and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So I hope y'all got those um, answers. So when most people think about bee, they think honeybee. And when most people think pollinator, they often are thinking honeybee. And there's so much more to life than just the honeybees. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the honeybee is not native. It came across the waters with the Europeans in the 1600s, which is rather interesting to think of bees on a boat, but that's how it happened. Um, the honeybee is a superorganism um, with a queen that lays eggs um, almost constantly. Um, so, and the hive is actually existing at all throughout the year. Um, they are a honey making bee. That's what they are, that are called the honeybee. There are seven species of honeybees in the world. The one we have, as I said, is the European honeybee. Um, very different from our native bee species. <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you know, but we actually have 4,000 species of bees that are native to North America and about 500 species are native to Oregon. So you'll notice on my slide here that I should say that they're better pollinators than honeybees. And if you go back to, <clears throat> excuse me, the hairy body bee, um, one of the differences that a honeybee will do versus a native bee, it will, hey, Natalie. It will pack on the pollen onto its leg and carry it back to the hive. And so it rarely drops the pollen onto the flowers. It's, it's not as good of a, a efficient, it's not as an efficient pollinator as um, the native bees because it's much more efficient at taking the pollen and the nectar back to the hive. Um, it is also, it also will fly at um, warmer temperatures. The native bees can fly at cooler temperatures. I already mentioned it's not a superorganism. There are also, <clears throat> excuse me, there are also studies out there that show that the honeybees can be detrimental to the native bee species. Um, because if you think about how many honeybees there are in a hive, there can be 50,000, there can be 100,000 um, bees in a hive. And compared to a uh, native bee we, that live um, with maybe Oh, 30, 30 eggs, it might lay 30 eggs in a lifetime. It really makes a difference in um, how many pollinators are out in the garden. So our native bees <clears throat> are essential for pollinating our native trees and shrubs. If you think about the beautiful shrubs and trees here in Oregon, manzanita, Oregon grape, all of those are loved and pollinated by our native bees. But they also can help with our fruit trees on our um, alfalfa and carrots and some of our other crops. Actually, the native and solitary bees are good pollinators for them. Um, and as they, the mints, native uh, honeybees love mint too. So a lot of the um, European plants that um, came over with the Europeans, um, the honeybees are gonna definitely be pollinating those. Back to um, a mason bee is a good example of a native bee that um, a lot of you have probably seen and might not known it. Um, I mentioned the time frame of a honeybee hive, which really goes on into perpetu perpetuity. Um, 
I don't think I said that right. Uh, the queen can live for several years, a honeybee queen. Um, there is no queen on most of the solitary bees. Um, they are just a female and she lays her eggs and then she goes on and, and dies after about six weeks. This is an example here of where the mason bee would have um, laid her eggs on the pollen and the nectar that she collects. They're called mason bees because you can see the mud that she collects. She puts in between the cells. Here's your egg that's laid on the pollen ball. And this is the front of this tube that um, where she's put the mud to cap it. I have a little video here. I'm going to see if I can play it of a mason bee that I found in my garden this past summer. You can see it's black and shiny and it flies quickly. Um, for me to catch this on film is unusual actually. That's a mason bee. And these are two photos that I've taken um, over time. You can see the difference in my camera. This is my old camera and this is my new camera. <laughs> Much difference in clarity there. Um, solitary bees um, will nest in many, many places. A lot of times it's really not apparent to us large human beings. Uh, this is my footprint that was there. And I, then I moved away and I was watching something and I happened to notice a bee going in and out of this uh, tumulus right here. Um, if you can't really see the hole, but trust me, I saw the bee going in and out. So that just shows you, this is red creeping thyme. This is a flower. So you can see um, here how tiny their nests can be. 70% of bees are nesting in the ground. Here's another one. This was um, um, a crack in between two pavers in my yard. Uh, and my husband, I didn't see it, but he told me he saw it. So I'm gonna trust him here. He saw a bee going in and out of this hole. And this is the tiny micro clover that comes up. I'm not sure what that is, but that gives you the sense of scale on how small that is. Bumblebees um, are really critical to um, our world. We have about 30 species here in the Northwest. Um, they do pollinate a lot of our agricultural crops. Um, bumblebees are both solitary and social. You do have a queen um, bumblebee. And so they are um, social for a while. Her daughters help her raise the rest of the um, brood for a while. She will live for a year. The queen will live for a year. Um, we do have two um, species of bumblebees here in the Northwest um, that are on the decline, the Western species, and then also the Franklins. The Franklins is probably extinct by now. It hasn't been seen since 2006 by Dr. Robin Thorpe. Um, but if you see a bee with a white tip, uh, on its abdomen, then maybe you're seeing a Western and that would be certainly something to report. Bumblebees, um, I think are beautiful creatures and such a fascinating lifestyle. They live um, in, uh, in the ground a lot of times uh, underground with a nest that looks something like this. She actually does make honey. So, um, but that's not something that human beings can really access. Um, I put on here a bunch, uh, bunch grass is actually really great um, um, habitat because it holds, covers them up like a roof. Um, and the queen um, is the mated female. She will overwinter. I mentioned she will live for a year. So she'll come out in the spring and um, start her brood uh, with the legs, with the eggs that she was fertilized with in the fall. So fall forage is really important for your yard because you want those, um, the bumblebee queens to be fat and happy when she goes into hibernate. Um, there's a link here for a uh, video, but since I'm assuming that most of you are going to want this um, PowerPoint presentation, I'll let you watch that at your leisure because I don't want to 
take up too much time, but there's a short little video there showing how they sonicate or buzz pollinate. I mentioned wasps before. I am really fascinated by wasps. Um, I wish I knew more about them. There are many, many species. This is just one, the ichneumon that we saw before. There's also gall um, wasps, paper wasps, which I wanna say just a moment about. Uh, the paper wasp looks a lot like a yellow jacket and it's just really not um, even the same temperament um, and they live in different places. So if you see the sort of triangular shaped um, papery, that's why they're called paper wasps, papery uh, um, hives up in, the, up in your roof lines, a lot of times those are paper wasps and they're very beneficial and they're not near as aggressive as um, the yellow jacket, which is shown here. Wasps are very important for the ecosystems. They do a lot to clean up um, some of the insects that you might not want um, in, your, in your yard. Um, so do try to keep be, try, do try to keep, be friends with the wasps. Um, the wasps will eat the uh, nectar of flowers as their carbohydrate. And then of course, insects and maybe even um, dead animal parts for um, their protein. Here's the hoverfly again. Um, you can see another that close up. Um, the reason I put white sweet alyssum here is because it is one of its um, best supporting pollinator plants. So if you can grow alyssum, it's not native, but it is a wonderful plant to have in your garden for many reasons. Um, hoverflies are important for you to have in your landscape because not only are they pollinators, but its larva will help with um, aphid control. And you can see one here sucking the juice out of an aphid. Um, you can actually see these with your naked eye. They're not um, minuscule. And hoverflies are one of the best pollinators um, after, after bees. Um, here's another link for you if you are interested in this kind of thing. Um, California lettuce growers um, use hoverflies. They actually put hover, um, white pseudolysum in between their lettuce crops to encourage hoverflies so that um, they don't have to use pesticides. Another fly, um, Anna Cassily took this picture and I just realized I don't have her name on the bottom of that. This is a tachinid fly um, and they, it actually looks like a lot like house flies if you just glance at it. But when you look at the body, you'll see that it's shaped a little different and it has a lot more bristly hairs on it. Um, if you are a monarch lover, you probably really do not like these flies because they are um, a parasitoid on caterpillars, um, so they can take out monarch caterpillars. Um, here's a picture of a monarch, um, excuse me, <laughs> not a monarch. Um, here's a picture of a larva of a tachinid fly coming out of a morning cloak um, chrysalis, which is another type of butterfly. So it is kind of icky to think about that. Um, butterflies, we have about 120 species in Oregon. I don't think we see enough butterflies. Um, I know we don't see enough monarchs. Um, I've seen a fair number of swallowtails this year. Um, and monarchs are not the only one that requires certain um, host plants. Um, part, uh, swallowtails feed on parsley and cottonwood, so they're not these are the, the caterpillars I'm talking about. So they're not as generalist as you might think. Um, so it is important to have a wide diversity of um, plants in your, in your yard. Um, this is a Budlia here. Um, it only provides nectar, no pollen. If you have one of the newer plants, um, the sterile plants, if you have an older Budlia, then you might want to um, remove that from your yard because it is invasive and it can go into the wild and take out um, some of the native plants that we would prefer to have. But this is an, um, a sterile species here, I know. Um, moths, here's the white line sphinx moth again. Um, so you can see some of them do come out earlier um, than just dark. 
Um, so they're not always nocturnal. And something that you may not know is that night pollination um, actually decreases. The moths that are doing the pollination at night actually decreases um, with light um, showing. Like, so if you have lights around your house or in your yard, that can actually impact the amount of pollination that's going on. So you might want to think about reducing your lights or getting uh, what's called dark sky lights so that the light is less um, apparent. Um, this particular white line sphinx moth species, um, it will nectar off of these um, plants, honeysuckle, columbine, monarda, as we can see here. And then um, the larva will feed on evening primrose, fireweed, angara, so it's somewhat limited. Beetles, another major pollinator. Um, hopefully you know what a lady beetle looks like. How many of you know what the larva of a lady beetle looks like? Um, not necessarily the prettiest creature, so um, now you know if you didn't before. There are 5,000 species of beetles, which is amazing um, to think how they have filled in throughout the niches of the of the ecosystem. Um, you can build what's called a beetle bank. You can see how this is raised and then it keeps the beetles in a drier area, um, especially if you've got native grasses there. So it'd be a fun project to have a school. Here's a couple more um, beetles that you might see in your yard. This is a longhorn flower beetle um, that I captured on a rose. And the soldier beetles, I'm always happy to see the soldier beetles come to the yard because they are also great aphid eaters. Um, I have a little story about aphids on peas and the soldier beetles came to the rescue. So um, those are, they look like fireflies, but they're not. We don't have fireflies here in, here in Oregon. The hummingbirds, um, another pollinator. Um, the pollen will get on the top of its head when it goes from flower to flower. There are five species in Oregon. These are the three that you might see here in the Rogue Valley. Um, they're going for the nectar in the plants. Um, and then they also do eat bugs, skeeter, um, skeeter eaters, mosquitoes, um, gnats, spiders, aphids again, even small bees. Okay, I'm gonna show this video, it's very short. Um, and I think you'll, like this, if it, let's see if we can get it up. There we go. Well, wow, that one didn't quite work. So you'll have to watch it on your own. And then just a reminder to keep your feeders clean because um, if they are left out in the sun, the, um, the um, liquid can ferment and it can make them sick and actually kill them. So if you're not aware of that, make sure you keep your feeders very clean. So now we're going to go to a sad part of the presentation. What are the challenges? I'm going to run through this one so we don't have to dwell on it too much. Um, challenges um, is, is a long list. I'm probably missing something. Here's a picture of a dead honeybee because they seem to get the most um, publicity, but I always wonder about the native bees and the other pollinators. So we have um, development, loss of habitat, all the way down to reduce protein and pollen because of the way the, our soil has um, declined, that the quality of our soil has declined over the past number of decades. Uh, here's a couple slides to make you think about um, where are they? If you remember as a child, perhaps, um, depending on how old you are, this top screen would be a common event after driving any distance. And now I think this is very, very common and we rarely see any insects. Uh, there's a lot of studies out that have shown about the decline of the insects 
over the past several decades. This particular one came out in 2019. If you Google worldwide decline of entomofauna, you'll be able to find that where they took studies and combined them and came up with the sad news that 40% of insect species are facing extinction over the next few decades. And perhaps it's not, uh, not under, it is understandable why, uh, not surprising I should say, why it's happening. Um, if when you look at places like this, and this is Medford, a map of Medford, um, where are the pollinators gonna live? And even this cute little house, I don't see any native pollinator plants, um, a lot of lawn, and that's just not gonna help the um, pollinators reproduce um, in this kind of environment. And then don't forget, there's a lot of lights in this situation. So what is a pesticide? They are um, components of um, the man-made chemicals that we've put together um, to kill uh, weeds, uh, other insects, fungicides are the three that we as gardeners um, probably see the most. There's also things that kill fish and birds and rodents, but we're not gonna talk about those so much today. Um, pesticides kill insects, no matter what kind. If it's an in, even a, um, an herbicide will kill insects, bees are insects, and so therefore pesticides kill bees. Here's just a few of the ones that you might see when you go shopping, um, hopefully not for these products. Um, I just wanna mention glyphosate is in Roundup, 2,4-D is in the turf builder. Um, the neonicotinoids really have gotten a lot of airplay, thank goodness. I wanna point out that um, when you go, if you go use one of these particular products, you will not see the word neonicotinoids on the bottle. Neonicotinoid is a class of insecticide. What you would see is something like imidacloprid. That's a common one that you're gonna see on the bottle. Um, and the neonicotinoids are systemic and so it impacts the pollen and the nectar and it's long livid and you can't wash it off. So it's definitely a product that um, should actually be banned from uh, use by gardeners. This shows you the pathway. It can actually impact the fish, the caddisflies and the mayflies. If you're a fisher person, then you should be concerned about neonicotinoids in the waterways um, because it's gonna harm a lot of creatures. It also impacts birds and it also impacts people. And you can find more about neonicotinoids on the Pollinator Project Rogue Valley website. So last, bad, last sad slide, and then we'll move on to some better things. Um, for those of you that remember when monarchs were around common, um, you, you can already get the feeling of what happens as time goes on and we have less and less and less and we have less and less memory of how it was before. Um, this is this quote here, looking for 8,999 more caterpillars to feed my babies. Dr. Doug Tallamy did a study um, in Delaware about the number of caterpillars that um, just one clutch of chickadee babies need. And um, he estimated it was between 6,000 and 8,000, um, 9,000 um, caterpillars just to raise um, one clutch of chickadee. So I'm not sure my yard has that many caterpillars in it. So hopefully yours does. Hopefully uh, that's some area that we can all improve on. So how can we help? Well, this is gonna be easy to do. Um, we want to be amazed, right? So this is a leaf cutter bee slide. This shows you the female, she has gone to her um, plant. In this case, it looks like a rose and she's cut out the circles um, and she's flying it back to her nest. These are um, the babies that she's, the cocoons that she has her pollen and nectar in and the egg and wrap them individually. And from the outside, it might look like this. And she's put a leaf in the um, front to to um, protect it 
Here's a leaf cutter bee right there. I don't know how well you can see that. So this is an amazing um, way <laughs> that um, this particular insect is. This bee, you can see again, she has a hairy body. She has hairy legs to um, help collect pollen and nectar. Leaf cutter bees actually carry most of their pollen on the underside of their abdomen. Um, and there is a video here. So when you get this PDF, you can um, watch that and learn more about the leaf cutter bees. So also get busy and let's plant a pesticide free pollinator garden. These are just some pretty pictures um, that I've collected. And I really like this um, picture from my friend Anna. Um, what we want to do is have native trees, shrubs, perennials. So you want to have a layered effect and you want to have the flowers that are going to be blooming early spring through late fall. And you want to have areas that you know you don't necessarily mess with. Just let it be for the pollinators to find um, their habitat, to find their home. You want to have different shaped flowers um, wide open to make it easy for the tiny little insects to get to or tubular for the hummingbirds and butterflies to get to. And then you also can have the larger um, blossoms like lupin, for instance, that bumblebees would be able to access easily. So if you think about that 120 million years that I had mentioned before, um, you can get an idea as to how these different insects have, have evolved with the different plants. Here's a few of my favorites, um, just a few lovely slides. You notice the different shapes of these flowers. Um, there's an insect, if you're not sure, that's a hoverfly. Uh, here's a few more. Some of these are native and some of these are not. The Lewisia is a native. Uh, some more. The Ceanothus, I would so highly recommend. If you do not have a Ceanothus in your yard, please get one. The goldenrod is for the fall. We mentioned that for the bumblebees. The native grasses, bunch grasses are excellent habitat um, as well as um, host plants for many of the butterflies. An oak tree is like a meadow in the sky. It serves so many um, species of insects. I mentioned uh, Doug Tallamy um, a moment ago, and we have Dr. Doug Tallamy to thank for the emphasis that's happening all across the country on growing native plants. This is his latest book called uh, Nature's Best Hope. Um, in an earlier book called Bringing Nature Home, he talked about the number of species that he found that, um, on a ginkgo tree versus a native oak. And if you think about from the soil all the way up to the um, treetops, how many species can be on a native plant versus a ginkgo tree, which is beautiful, but it came from China. And so our insects and birds have not evolved to be with that particular tree. Here's another video that I would suggest you watch when you have time. Um, and I'm happy to send any of these to you. If you don't particularly want the PowerPoint, I can send you the links. So plant choices matter. Um, this is a physocarpus or a nine bark. This is the more or less straight species, meaning it hasn't been cultivated. This particular one has, and you see how dark the leaves are. And Dr. Doug Tallamy has done some research at um, his Mount, at the Mount Cuba Center um, in Delaware, I think. And they have found that these purple leaves are actually distasteful, if not um, harmful to the insects that you want to be eating your leaves so that those insects are in your yard. I actually have taken out a couple of these beautiful Diablos, uh, physocarpus in my own yard because I learned about it after the fact. Um, Pollinator Project Oak Valley is transforming, has transformed, I should say. This was back in May of 2019, and this is what it look, looks like now in August of 2020. Um, so we've gone from mostly non-native to maybe 60% native species here that are growing. Um, this is a south-facing all day long 
hot and dry. And we've only had three deaths. <laughs> And you can find uh, the list of the plants that were growing here. Of course, you can just come by the office in Phoenix. So we want to give the insects a home in addition to providing them with pollen and nectar and leaves, of course, um, to eat the butterflies and moth chrysalises. You want to have a home for them. So speaking of butterflies, this is an Anna swallowtail pupa that has affixed itself to this stalk. And if you're out there cleaning up your garden in the fall, I don't know if you will particularly notice that this is there. So we need to make sure that we leave the leaves. We need to have plants overwintering. Um, think about keeping a messy area. Hedgerows are really important where we have lots of different sizes of plants, trees, shrubs, and um, the annuals and the perennials. This is a lovely picture of a, a stalk of maybe raspberry where a small carpenter bee has gone in and pulled out the pith so that she can make her nest. So keeping cut um, stalks through the uh, fall and winter is really important. So you'll see I have here wait till spring to clean up. I'm going to reiterate leaving the leaves as much as possible because we have so many beneficial insects um, that will pupate and overwinter so that we can have them next year. Um, mentioned the 70% of bees nest in the ground earlier. Here's some more underground magic happening. This is a nest of a bumblebee and you can see the honey pots here and her daughter's helping work. You want to provide moisture either for honeybees or for the puddling of the butterflies. And then that mud is also used for mason bees. So where would you rather live? This is the same house, maybe a year later. Um, you can see there's nothing here in this top picture for any pollinator whatsoever. And Robin has just transformed her yard to look like that. So I know where I would rather live and I presume that the pollinators would rather live in this larger picture too. So almost through, um, just as a reminder, we don't wanna just have um, you know, that yard over there and that yard over there. We wanna connect them with public spaces as well as private spaces um, because our, our um, landscape is already so fragmented. So what can we do? How can we think about making sure that there's that connectivity? Um, we don't want to isolate species. Um, we want to keep them from going extinct and, and just by, by being separated. Um, Pollinator Pro Project Rogue Valley is, has a rogue buzzway project going where you can put your pollinator habitat on the map if you fit in with the different criteria we've been talking about, then you can certainly self-certify. And it's even more important now because of the fire that came through our valley um, back in September. And you can see how much land has been impacted and so much of that land is um, places where people lived and had gardens. Um, here's a link to an article put out by OSU about what impact will the fire have on bees. Um, so when the, not just this one here in the valley, but all the ones in Oregon, it was written about that. So my last slide here is just a few of the resources that you would find helpful. Um, the demonstration gardens um, at the extension, Master Gardener's extension. Here's the pollinator project road Valley website, and you can find a list of nurseries, plants, pollinator information. I highly recommend Xerces. They are obviously the premier um, organization in the, well, maybe I can say the world, right, Phyllis? Um, Bee City USA. Um, and Lynn Kuntzman did a presentation a few weeks ago um, that was really just great about native plants and pollinators and birds. And if you're only gonna buy one book, then I would recommend this particular one to learn all about pollinators and habitat and what you can do. So there's my presentation and I'm back to you.